Hi, Dr. Patrick Gentempo here, and thank you for joining us on our YouTube channel. We have great content in store for you. I'm so excited to be here with you, and let's jump right into it. We were fortunate enough uh, that you were able to conduct a lot of our interviews because you have such a wonderful knowledge base and have such a passion around this particular subject, so, uh, so thank you for that. Um, I believe is important is understanding all the interconnections and synergies amongst all these things because I think one of the challenges is that too many people are trying to isolate small details and not seeing the so-called big picture. And uh, one of the things that you had said prior to the interview, which I think is worth talking about, is the implications that now they're proposing GMO trees. Yeah. And, uh, and now that even widens <laughs> the picture even more. So talk about that, please. Well, so yeah, it really does. And I think that trees are, are one of those plants that people look at and admire, but don't really understand them as social beings. Mm -hmm. the trees communicate with each other. They communicate through their roots. They communicate through rhizomes in the ground. Forests are highly interconnected. There's a reason that some trees are very slow growing. They're the baby trees and they can be really slow growing. And there's a reason for that because the slower they grow, the, the longer they live. And part of that is controlled by the mother, by the parent trees. So there's all that. And then there's how they reach out and touch each other. Um, just what we can see visually, but also under the ground, they actually are interconnected. And if you kill one tree that's interconnected to another tree, often that other tree can die. Mm -hmm. They're much more complex than we know, and they're certainly highly adaptive. So the, the implication of a genetically modified tree for a specific tree is not, pro is, I'm assuming, not taking into account. And I can assume that safely because I understand the GMO crops that have come before them, and they haven't taken into account the holistic environment and the life cycle of everything around those plants, right? So we can assume that that's how these trees have been engineered as well. They're for specific traits, like if it's for lumber, I'm assuming growing faster, or you know, there, there could be any number of reasons. So there's a lot of things that we're doing as humans that are disrupting the tree life cycle and their interconnectedness, and that is causing them to be more vulnerable to infections. And so we're coming up, instead of doing the right thing, which is standing back, listening, and studying trees and see what they really flourish and what they need in a long life cycle, mm -hmm. because 80 years is a short life for a tree. We think of trees as only living 80 to 120 years because they're cut down in lumber at that age, but the truth is that trees will live on to hundreds and hundreds of years. There's trees that are known to be thousands of years old. Well, I mean, they obviously know what they're doing. Yeah. <laughs> you know, they know what they're doing. They're living longer than we are. And we need to coexist with them, that's for sure. We, we absolutely need to coexist with them because without the trees, we're really screwed. I mean, we need trees for oxygen. And, you know, the whole point here is that, you know, they're looking to now genetically modify trees. So we get to a point where we're like playing God with, uh, you know, with what's around us, and but we don't have that omniscience to be able to do it. Well, not only that, I mean, God, you know, if you talk about God, whatever that means for you, it was an evolutionary long process with trial and error and all these other systems that adapted to each other. And so to think that we can just create different traits or better traits by bringing in DNA from other species, to think that we can do that and not affect everything else is wrong. And it's the mistake we've made with farming. And we're making the same mistake now with arborism, with trees. And really what we needed to do was to go backwards. Monoculture hasn't worked. You know, monoculture breeds infection. And instead of saying, okay, hmm, we tried this. It's not working, let's go back and try regular farming methods that we did years before that worked better, you know, we're just gonna create more and more problems. And the big issue is what happens when those genetically engineered trees get spread and now affects forests that we rely on for oxygen, for cleansing the air, for recooling the earth's surface, and affects them negatively in ways we can't even predict. I mean, we have no idea. It's just one big experiment with no precautionary principle at all. What got you interested in the GMO uh, issue in the first place? Well, two things. So the, the, the health issue. I mean, pesticides are not healthy. And when you have a plant that's, you know, glyphosate tolerant, that means you can pour more glyphosate on it. And, it, and that is actually what's having, being done, right? So who wants more pesticides? So I understand, and these are herbicides as well, right? These are herbicides. They're actually antibiotics for the most part, right? They're disrupting anything that works through the shikimate pathway. You know, people can say, well, that's not human cells, but it's actually all the bacteria that we rely on, on our skin, in our gut, 
our gut's responsible for making our neurotransmitters, for our immun immunity, for digestion, for vitamin levels. I mean, come on, how can you say that's not related? So that kind of got me into this whole GMO, but the other aspect is that this is being forced upon us. Mm -hmm. And it's an experiment that's uncontrolled and unfettered, and it's, we have no idea what we're doing. You know, and really, once you got, start getting the GMO seeds spread and infecting other people's crops that are su supposedly organic or just commercial non, you know, regular non-GMO, it's too late. It, it's contaminated. The contamination issue is huge. People don't realize that. So if, for instance, it's a bad idea and now everything's contaminated, we're done. We have no way to go backwards. And so when you make it so everyone's been tainted with GMOs, or just let's say Roundup, just glyphosate. And it's in everyone. Now you can no longer say whether it's affecting people's health because we have no control group. And so that's another issue that for me is just horrible. This is fascism. This is, you know, I don't want that. I don't want that in my environment. I don't want my children eating that. I don't want to eat it. I should have a right to say no. You've interviewed a lot of experts about GMOs, some who are maybe pro-GMO and some or many that are uh, against GMO. Uh, can you highlight some of the interviews and some of your experience? Yeah, and I interviewed um, a Canadian, um, he was an agricultural financial advisor mm -hmm. and he was a very Agriculture big... Agriculture meaning he consults with farmers? Yes, or, with, okay. yes, and how to make more money. Okay. And of course that involved using GMOs. Mm -hmm. That's That was his argument and that it's great for the farmers and it's great for people and they're safe. And you know, he, this was his stance and he was really, and I believe that he believed everything he said. Mm -hmm. Okay, I, I want you to know, I don't think he was a liar at all. Like I think this guy- He was really sincere in his beliefs. Sincere in, in everything he said, but he didn't quite understand the concept of attributable risk, mm -hmm. which that concept is that unless you compare an unexposed population to something you're studying, you can cannot say there is zero risk. You cannot say anything about the risk unless you do that. They haven't done that, and I got him to admit that. Mm -hmm. But he didn't, you know, he didn't he had never heard of attributable risk. Mm -hmm. He didn't know the concept. And I kept saying, well without if we don't have an, a controlled population where we have people who've not been touched by Roundup, let's say, then we don't have a way to study its effect. Because that's gold standard. You've got to look at a controlled population. And if we don't have a controlled population anymore, we can never make that statement, right? So that's that was a big problem for me with him. Well, he's obviously a non-scientist, right? Right, and, and, then, he, and he said that. And, and you're going to have confirmation bias, right? So somebody who's got a, vet, a vested interest um, wants to know the talking points to support their position, but when it comes down to the actual data, um, you know, you're exactly right. You know, we basically, this is a, an uncontrolled experiment that's released out into our environment. Um, it is, you know, something that is highly disturbing. And there's the two dimensions of it. I'd like to hear your view on both of them. One sure. of which is GMOs themselves, in and of themselves separate from, from the what's pest. sprayed on them. Mm -hmm. And then of course, you know, the Roundup and other things that are sprayed on GMOs, uh, what the effects of that is. So let, let's start with the GMOs in and of themselves. Some people, in, in, even in this program, some people said, I'm not that concerned about GMOs in and of themselves. It's what's sprayed on that's a concern. How do you see it? Yeah, I mean, because we all equate pesticide with toxins, so mm -hmm. that's like, a, I think, a knee-jerk reflex, and I agree with that in, in, in for most people. And, and I am concerned about the pesticides, but, you know, P BT toxin, let's talk about that. So yeah. that's a, a, um, a gene that's been inserted in corn. Mm -hmm. And it is, you know, it's it's a it's an it's a gene activator or a gene suppressor. I mean, these these fragmented DNA pieces that come from other species that are put in to turn on and turn off genes. Do we know that they're not turning on and off genes in our own in ourselves? We don't know that, right? If they're turning on and off genes in pests, why couldn't they be turning on and off genes? We're closely related. I mean, our DNA. You know, there's a lot in common with our DNA and our systems, right? And to also create um, genetically engineered things that change a trait in in that in that produce in whatever it is a tomato 
do we know how that is going to affect us when we ingest it? It's not been studied. I mean, it sounds like just in theory it could be a problem, like, oh, well, maybe it's a small problem, but we really don't know. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. We really don't know. So while we do know that pesticides cause cancer, they kill our bacterial flora, which can create all kinds of problems, so we know that they're scary. So I think that's why most people say, well, I'm more concerned about the pesticides mm -hmm. and less concerned about the GMO, because we don't know. Thanks so much for being here and watching that video. And can I ask you to please subscribe to our channel so you can find out when we're posting new content. You'll be alerted right away when we do. To share this with people you think might benefit from the information. And certainly it helps us if you like the video. So if you like what you just saw, go ahead and hit that like button. And again, thank you so much for being here with me right now.